Um, I never realized I was a leader. I kind of just had to be, um, in the sense that musically, I started playing professionally at 12 and touring and everything at 14. And it got to a point where I had my own ideas and nobody was paying me to do my own music. So I had to put together a band of musicians uh, at 17 or 18 to play my own music. And I just became a leader by default. And it kind of just spilled over into other things. You know, you do one thing on your own and you figure you can do something else. And next thing you know, you're leading people <laughs> to do all kinds of stuff. No, uh, but there was a moment where I realized that um, I could do it. Because to be a leader is a choice sometimes, sometimes it's not, right? Um, but I've led musicians for 30 years. Um, but it wasn't really until I did this big project, the 12 album cycle, and I just called in every favor that I felt like people not, I don't believe in that leader follow hierarchical kind of thing, but that people uh, um, were aligned with the vision and would move in a way that would help realize the vision. And it, it showed me a lot about how um, activating trust is important. And if you're gonna lead anything, you have to develop not only those relationships, but the level of trust in your capacity to, to accomplish that thing and people trust that ability, and you can activate that community of trust to get the thing done. And it was in this thing that I know that I couldn't have done on my own that I really realized how important that was and how, how people saw me in that space that you could call a leader. So uh, I don't really have life heroes. I grew up without my dad in the house, so I developed what um, Neil, Gra Neil deGrasse Tyson calls composite sketches instead of role models. So I, I looked at that person or that person or that person or that person. I took aspects of, aspects of their personality and, and really used those nuggets to form kind of my ideal sense of, of what beingness was. Um, so I don't have a single person that I can point to and say that's what I model myself after or uh, their leadership style is something that I uh, want to be. I, I don't have that. Uh, so my real favorite hobby is playing video games. <laughs> PlayStation 4, 2K20, got it in a box whenever I can get to it. Um, but, I mean, there are a lot of things that I do in my work that are also fun. So, I love to read, and I'll read history, theology, politics, all that kind of stuff for fun and for research. Because um, I just love to learn, I, I love riding my bike, I love playing the drum set, I love composing music. So, when I'm in that space, I don't really differentiate work and pleasure because it's all the same. Oh, so as militant as people think I am, I like uh, those old 30s and 40s radio shows, like uh, The Shadow and <laughs> uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, Prairie Home Companion, even, it's the whitest stuff ever. But that, I, I love the stories and like the imagination behind it. And uh, I remember I was in New Orleans back in 2001 and Prairie Home Companion had their movie uh, that was out and I went to see it and I was the only spot in the theater. <laughs> I was not only the only black person, I was the youngest person. So I go in there and everybody's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, what's the news from Lake Wilbegon? And they're like they're clapping and everybody knows what's going on. So yeah, <laughs> a little Americana. I never had a best friend growing up. I had, um, I mean, I had a brother, so I didn't have, like, it's, it's hard for me to develop those kind of relationships. Um, in high school, Chris was 
like a big brother. He was a saxophone player a year ahead of me. And then I also met um, Eddie Baird, who is my current musical compadre partner, uh, creative partner. And I, I guess he's the closest thing I've ever had to a best friend. But I didn't meet him until I was 16, 17. Excellence. My favorite form of artistry is excellence. So regardless of sector, discipline, genre, what have you, if you're a golfer, a basketball player, a tennis player, a painter, a carpenter, if it's excellent, then that really inspires me. My favorite ice cream flavor is chocolate. <laughs> That's easy. I have several. Um, the one I probably use the most is, the, the quote I use the most is kind of like my favorite, is uh, James Baldwin's, not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Uh, and I love that quote because oftentimes in today's microwave culture, we want to solve problems without understanding them. And we wonder why things don't change when we've applied X amount of dollars or X amount of energy and attention. But it's because we didn't understand the fundamental causes of whatever it is we're trying to solve. And so we have to face those things for what they are in order to understand them and give context for the current situation that allows us to then move forward with a solution. Um, but my ultimate favorite quote um, kind of makes me a dick because it's uh, John Henry Clark. He says, I only argue with my equals. All others I teach. <laughs> that, that's my favorite quote of all time. But you can't say that to people because then they're like, you're a hater. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My life mantra really is you gotta do what you gotta do. Do what you gotta do in order to do what you wanna do. I consider myself a musician. I haven't played jazz in a long time. Jazz is interesting because, so with black music in America, black musicians have never named the music, right? And jazz used to be a derogatory term in the, in the folk tradition or oral tradition that um, basically means um, masculine ejaculatory liquids, <laughs> right? So it was a term applied to a music to degrade it. Um, and the great Max Roach jazz drummer, what many would call a jazz drummer, would say that it's just the music of. So if you're listening to Charles Mingus, it's not jazz, it's the music of Charles Mingus. Um, because Mingus had so many elements that were beyond that word. You know, even Louis Armstrong back in the day said he didn't appreciate that word. Um, and so I say that I'm a practitioner of black music uh, because I deal with everything from the Negro spiritual to hip hop and everything in between and beyond. But um, mostly I'm just a musician. I, there's just so many so much music and so many different people, you know what I mean? Um, but I'm probably most inspired directly and indirectly by Duke Ellington, um, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, who's an African-American composer. Um, I'm inspired by uh, voices of um, like great singers like um, Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, uh, Roberta Flack, Donny Hathaway, Marvin Gaye, um, Joe Williams is an amazing voice um, because the voice can communicate things. It's interesting, I don't write for voice because I haven't found a singer that matches that quality of um, performance ability and ability to shape songs the way some of those people I named do. Um, John Coltrane, obviously, Charles Mingus, 
uh, Max Roach, all kind of folks. I, I don't have a, but those are the folks like, if I'm stuck, if I'm trying to figure something out, that's what I go listen to. Okay. <laughs> There is no juggling. You just do what you gotta do in order to do what you wanna do. And sometimes what I wanna do is just sleep. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so you just, I, I don't know. My wife would probably say I don't juggle well. Um, but there are just, just times where things have to get done and you do it. You know? I, get, I got back from Syracuse at 4.30 on a Saturday and my youngest daughter's birthday slumber party started at five. There's no balance. You just go right from one to the other. You know, my daughters just think I'm that weird dude that sings to himself all the time. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Okay. I mean, Amir's 18, but she doesn't care. Yeah. I mean, I don't need. I don't necessarily know that they should. Right? They probably will talk about legacy later. Um, but they've been at my big concerts. They. I did a concert at their school and they both introduced me and so they've read my bio, but I don't know if it means anything to them. You know what I mean? Like, they don't know that, yet. That yeah. They will definitely recognize just it. I'm just dead, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you know, they don't see me in popular culture in those ways that they see other musicians that are, you know, famous, so to speak. You know. That's interesting that I would have never known that you didn't have a best friend. I'm an, I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. You don't get to where I've gotten on my instrument making friends. I mean, you do that like <laughs> you're, so in, your, in your bedroom. Your was your best friend. Yeah, literally. I slept with my first drum set. Well, we do right. remember, I remember uh, some of my first encounters with you and you were in school. Mm -hmm. and you, you probably saw me with books in my hand. and Your laptop. Yep. At the time you, I mean, I don't think, I don't think your mind could even think of much of anything else. You, you were so focused on school. Yeah. But you are, but I didn't know at the time, I'm just like, there's this man that's studying, you know, music. <laughs> I didn't know you were a prodigy. I mean, do you, did you see yourself as a, do you so, see yourself now? I mean, my I mean, mom had me assessed when I was two years old. And the story goes, I could play as well as a 10 year old in terms of coordination but she didn't invest in it so I mean I just started playing at church at six I started um, getting paid to play at church when I was 12 and I started touring with gospel groups when I was 14 so it was just like that's what I did yeah you, you know? were the one who shed light on to me about the church ministry getting paid I was like they get a check <laughs> you're like oh, I wouldn't have been there if they didn't <laughs> I wouldn't say I've been accepted. Mm. Um, so, in, in 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 music, no matter the genre, I would put forth that in order to be accepted, you have to do things that people accept. Mm. And my goal has always been to do what I wanted to do, the way I wanted to do it. And so I've been fired from five churches, I've been fired from more bands, I've been fired a lot. Um, because, like Prince said, you just hear the music your way, and you always have to then, if you're gonna do that, you have to create your own environment so that you can create the way you wanna create. And so, um, because I've invested in my own work that way, I've not made a lot of friends in the music business. You know, uh, I got dropped from a record company because they didn't want me to put out a record called Black Lives Matter, and I put it out anyway. I'm an artist. I'm a blue collar artist. I mean, I, I put in work and when it's done, we put it out and then we're on to the next project, you know? And the record company couldn't keep up with my pace. And so I said, well, you know, you don't have to put it out. I'll do it myself. And I did it. And I had just put out a record like in October and we released this in December. They didn't like that because they thought the records would be competing with each other. And I was like, well, that's your problem, not mine. And so I put it out and then I got a letter. I was like, okay, deuces. And I was like, I don't need you anyway. And I, you know, I haven't been signed since, and I've had several conversations, but if they can't do for me what I can do for myself and more, then I don't need them. Um, 
I believe in something called collective individualism, right? So if as individuals, we operate in our most optimum capacity and we do that together as a collective, then we can accomplish things together that we couldn't have as individuals, right? Um, not everybody sees things that way because they just see that individual person doing something different, right? But we talk about American exceptionalism and then we want people to line up and conform. So if anything, I'm a non-conformist, you know, and I always am pushing myself to do something new for me. It might not be new for anybody else, but it, it challenges me to think differently about my work and to produce something uh, because I'm challenging my own thinking all the time. I'm always learning something new. And um, I feel if I get comfortable, then I have failed. And to be accepted, to be popular, oftentimes that production or that output is something that makes people comfortable. My final goal, honestly, is to help people see themselves differently so they can um, optimize their capacity and make the world a better place. Um, and that's from both an artistic aesthetic, a personal goal, a social, political, spiritual thing. There's this thing called cymatics, C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-I-S, it's a Greek word for wave. And it's an area of physics that studies how frequency or sound affects the physical world, right? So you heard about the, the flower or the plant experiment where they played uh, loud music like um, heavy metal and the plant died and then they played Mozart and the plant grew and lived. Well, that's uh, uh, not necessarily a reflection of the music itself, it's a reflection of the frequencies, right? So the way popular music, heavy metal, rap, um, even others, um, is mixed and mastered, the wave is just a solid block. Whereas classical music is mastered differently, so the wave has more shape. And that kind of shape, that flexibility, is a more healthy, frequential um, kind of output for the plant. Like Than that. it is for if, if you're rock and roll or what have you. So it's unconsciously yeah. happening, mm -hmm. is what you're almost saying. And we're, they're creating the wave that is unhealthy. Absolutely. Like for music. Absolutely. Okay. And so the goal as a musician is to talk about that and help people understand the difference and help people curate better what they feed themselves.